Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Dave Coombs. I'm a superintendent of schools with the Upper Canada School Board. With me today in my office is Jennifer McDonald. Jennifer is a manager with our Human Resources Department, and many of you who have been making inquiries about the process have probably been contacting her. So thank you, Jennifer, for being a part of today. Thank you. So just for your information, we are recording this. Uh, so we do hope to have it uh, available for those people that couldn't join us today. Um, I also know that there are people from different time zones who may be wishing to uh, uh, access this information. So we will be posting this later um, just for your information or if you wish to refresh your memory. Uh, also, um, if, uh, if at, at any time if you are having difficulty hearing me, please uh, pipe in and let me know. Uh, but I would appreciate it if everybody would mute their uh, microphones just so that we don't have any background noise. Uh, if you are having difficulty, let me know and I'll uh, try to uh, remedy that. Uh, I'm, I've got a, a fairly uh, concise presentation, probably about 15 or 20 minutes. We'll give lots of uh, time for questions at the end. Um, so if you could please just hold on to your questions until I, uh, I wrap up, uh, we'll be happy to entertain each one as we go. So um, thank you again for joining us and uh, this is a uh, um, uh, presentation of information regarding our principal and vice principal selection process. It's for the fall of 2017 and uh, hopefully this will answer most of your questions and uh, just to give you a little bit of context also for this, pr this process, um, some of the things that are specific to our neck of the woods here in eastern Ontario and uh, the context for our board right now. So uh, for those of you that uh, are calling in may not have access to the presentation um, or can't see your presentation on my screen, I'm presenting right now. So you should see a screen right now with the mission, vision and values of the Upper Canada School Board on it. Uh, but we have posted this presentation on our external website, ucdsb.on.ca. If you go to careers in UCDSB, at the very bottom, this presentation is posted. So um, again, you can follow along uh, and um, uh, afterwards, if you wish to go back and access it, it'll be there as well. So I guess first thing I'm going to do is talk about our mission, vision, values. And again, for, for those of you that are internal to the board, this will be, um, uh, this will be familiar to you. Uh, but I think it's, it's helpful to go over this again, uh, that our mission is to prepare all students for a successful life. And when we say all, we truly mean all. And, and we're very uh, proud of the fact that we are the public education system and we take everybody, regardless of where you come from, regardless of your background, regardless of where you've been. Um, everybody has access to free public education and we take that charge very, very seriously. Um, and you know, we take great pride in the fact that we program and we welcome for all students. Uh, and that means students who are, uh, you know, heading for uh, great things in university and onwards, those students that are working towards other destinations, we consider them all of equal value, uh, including those students who have very profound needs. Um, we welcome everybody and we serve them well. Uh, that's our mission. And uh, again, like I said, uh, anybody who wants to be a leader in our system has to take that very seriously. I believe public education is it's the uh, flank of a democratic uh, society. Um, it's absolutely critical to all, all we hold dear as a civilized society in Canada. And, and uh, I can't emphasize that enough, that, um, uh, that being a leader in the public education system is a tremendous calling. And uh, it's one that I feel profoundly lucky to have had spent, to spent uh, the majority of my career working in. So who are we? Well, um, uh, we are uh, a, a very um, uh, large geographic board. Uh, we're a little bit bigger than Prince Edward Island, so we're provincial in size. Uh, we have over 80 schools, we have over 26,000 students, uh, but we are predominantly a rural board. Uh, we're outside of Ottawa, so we kind of ring that area outside of Ottawa. Um, and we go from Gananoque, that is just east of Kingston, all the way to the Quebec border. Uh, we encompass larger towns like Brockville, Cornwall, and Smith Falls. Uh, we also have a lot of bedroom communities of Ottawa, 
uh, in Almont, Perth, Kempville, Rockland. Um, but we also have a lot of small schools that are very rural. Um, and certainly that's our reality is that we are a lot of small schools. And um, certainly if you're interested in leading in our system, you have to understand uh, that rural complexity and all the advantages and quite frankly some disadvantages that that means. Um, we are, um, uh, you know, that, that rural context, and I'm going to speak to it in, the, in, the, in, in uh, a couple of slides from now, um, but that really is important because, um, uh, you know, in, in Toronto, you know, a school of 400 in elementary is considered very small. A school of 400 in our, uh, in our system in elementary is considered extremely large. Same with our secondary schools. You know, our average secondary school is 360 kids. Uh, I'll let that sink in a little bit. That's 22 high schools, average size, about 360, 365. Um, and again, in Toronto, 1,200 is considered sort of a medium-sized school. So it's really important that when we go through this process of the kind of people we're looking for, that they have an understanding of that situation, that that really, um, uh, it, it stretches our resources. It certainly makes it very uh, interesting. It comes around budget time and how we allocate those resources. And so we really need people who are going to be flexible, innovative, and creative of how we deliver our program. So uh, the next slide says who you are. So yeah, we are looking for leaders um, and we're putting together an eligibility list or a pool um, because we anticipate having a lot of vacancies over the next couple of years in our administrative panel. Um, and so this just happens to be a demographic blip right now. Uh, over the next two or three years, we anticipate about a 50% turnover in our principal and vice principal cadre. Um, so this just, you know, we want to plan and make sure that we have um, an adequate number of people on our bench, so to speak, so that we can fill those roles with the right people in the right place. Um, and again, I really want to emphasize the reason why we have a we need a larger bench than perhaps other boards is that geographically we're really dispersed. So you might be the perfect candidate for a school in Van Cleek Hill, but you live in Gananoque. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't place somebody in Van Cleek Hill if we've got to put them on the road two hours one way. So we need people geographically located to, um, uh, uh, to uh, take on roles uh, in, uh, in schools nearby. I often get a lot of questions saying, well, you know, where would you send me uh, if I was a vice principal or principal in your school? We do take into consideration where you live. And as I said before, putting an administrator on the road for an hour, an hour and a half one way is not in the best interest of the school and it's not in the best interest of your wellness. So um, we do take into consideration where you live and we do need people in all areas of our board. So the next slide uh, has the title Leadership Capacities and um, the Ontario Leadership Framework, uh, as in all boards, is sort of our base document. It's our default document when we talk about leadership in Ontario and public education. So um, I don't expect you, and please, uh, we're not going to quiz you on the individual capacities and skills listed in the OLF, so don't ple please don't bother memorizing them. Um, but you should know the five major domains, and those are setting goals, aligning resources, promoting collaborative learning, using data, and engaging in courageous conversations. And that really is a good framework by which to, um, uh, to understand the role of school leadership. We spend a lot of time talking about personal leadership resources and slide six has those listed. Our board emphasizes the PLRs, personal leadership resources, uh, and we take that very seriously. So um, a lot of the questions in our interviews are based on these. So, um, you know, I, I, people will ask me sometimes, what does it take to be a school leader? Or how do I know I'm ready to be a school leader or I'd be good at it or I'd enjoy it? And I always say to them, do you like solving problems? Uh, because if you're a school leader, problems are coming to you. You don't have to go looking for them. They get placed on your desk on a daily basis. Uh, and perhaps more importantly, do you like solving problems with other people? Um, if you like working in isolation, this really isn't the gig for you. If you like solving problems, collaboratively to the betterment of student achievement, student wellness, then this could be something that you would really enjoy. 
Um, what's your relational awareness? So how do you get along with people? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> can you build those kind of trusting professional relationships that helps get things done? Um, and if, if you're one who really gets frustrated working in groups or working with people who may not agree with you, like I said again, this may, need, may not be a good role for you. Uh, because our expectation, thank you, is that you are working with other people, uh, including some that perhaps might not be on our mission, you know, and getting them and building those kind of relationships so that we can, again, so we can accomplish collectively what would be hard to do individually. <coughs> and finally, and this is really one I'd like to emphasize, do you have a growth mindset? And perhaps another way of saying it, are you coachable? Um, are you willing to say, here's what I did, these are kind of the, act <coughs> excuse me, the actions which I, I took today, what could I have done better? Um, are you reflective in your as a practitioner? Um, do you enjoy being coached? Uh, if, if you're kind of a, a person, again, who is um, a bit of a free agent and likes to work by yourself, this isn't really a good role for you. Uh, we really need people who like working with others, who like being coached, who like coaching others, um, and that's different, uh, a different role of being a boss. Being a boss in a school uh, 15, 20 years ago was very different. It was very directive. It was, I'm going to tell you and you're going to do it. Um, now, uh, collaboration is the watchword and certainly something that we are looking for uh, through this process. So slide seven talks a little bit more about that context for leadership in our board. So a lot of our schools are small and rural. Uh, and again, that stretches our resources. It's also a great thing too, because you have really tight knit communities who really support their schools. They love their little schools. Um, and certainly it provides a challenge for us to try to service those schools adequately um, and uh, to also uh, provide program that is uh, that meets the needs of all kids. Um, an aging population shifting government priorities, I don't have to tell you, you probably are already aware, the demographics are not in the favor of uh, public education going forward in that um, uh, we just have fewer kids. I came to this board in 1999. At that time, we had about 44,000 students. Uh, we have almost half of them now. Um, and, uh, you know, back then, um, you know, I was at a school uh, that had about uh, 900 kids that school has about 500 now, and actually that school has kept its numbers uh, fairly well. So you have to understand, in an aging resources, the Ministry of Education going forward, they're going to have a lot of stress on them uh, to, um, to provide medical resources for the aging population that are more interested in hip replacements and knee replacements than funding new schools and increased um, educational priorities. We anticipate that that's going to be something going forward in the next five, ten years, uh, that's going to be a struggle. So those will be challenges, ones we're sure we can meet, but we need the right people in schools to meet them. Um, uh, certainly, you know, there's an expectation that there is greater personalization for the student journey. The day when you simply taught out of one textbook to the entire group of kids has gone. Um, and uh, some teachers are um, embracing that, some teachers are not. Uh, we need leaders that are going to help people move in that direction. Uh, certainly, and if you talk to any of our leaders now, the demand for men mental health services is not going to go away and it's only going to increase. Um, and certainly that's a challenge right around uh, North America, quite frankly, but in Ontario as well. Um, and it's one that we have uh, a lot of in, uh, initiatives to try to meet. Um, and that's certainly something which, um, you know, is something through this process. We are looking for people who uh, are familiar with this challenge and um, have some ideas about how to work with others to try to meet them. Um, we, we are um, a really cool board, uh, board to work for if you're a bit of a techie. Uh, we have a very small but really kind of like a boutique tech department that has been on the cutting edge of uh, educational technology in Ontario and in fact quite acro uh, right across Canada and we've had boards from as far away as Alberta uh, and BC uh, seek us out to, to uh, you know, figure out how we do what we do. Um, so from a techie standpoint, um, we are looking for people who are comfortable in that regard, um, who that see the opportunities presented in technology and not just the problems. Um, 
Uh, and finally, uh, you know, as a board of education, as public education, we are going to be held more accountable for results. Uh, and, uh, and that means our school leaders have to feel comfortable with that and have an understanding of what accountability means. On slide eight, um, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, we did a fairly comprehensive survey with our school leaders. And we asked them the question about, you know, how has school leadership changed? And as you see there, about 96% uh, said over the last five, 10 years, things have really changed. Leadership is a different gig. Uh, and um, a lot of re there's a lot of reasons for that. And we've had a lot of conversations about what those may be. Certainly technology has changed. Um, I'm a superintendent for nine years now. When I was a principal, uh, Facebook was just getting started. There was no such thing as Twitter or Snapchat uh, or Yak or uh, Yik Yak or uh, uh, Instagram. Um, so certainly technology has changed the complexity of how we deal with kids and with communities and with stakeholders. The expectation of immediate communication uh, has um, risen uh, tenfold. Um, when I was a principal and we had something happen and uh, perhaps we had to call the fire department, um, I just sent a letter home the next day and that was considered fine in the way of communication. Um, now uh, we have to be much more, um, much more accessible, much more transparent and much more light in our feet. We give a lot of support to our leaders in that regard, uh, but it certainly is just one way in which the job has changed. Certainly the mental health challenges uh, have, uh, have increased. We have a real um, I would say uh, an epidemic of anxiety in our society and certainly within our students. And I believe that that certainly is something which um, we're going to have to continue to try to address better going forward. In slide nine, uh, we asked them, um, you know, what, what kind of training would you like given this new reality? Uh, and you'll see there the number one thing people wanted was facilitating learning teams. So the biggest change, I think, from the last five to 10 years is the expectation that if you're a leader in our schools, you're also an instructional leader. In fact, first and foremost, you're an instructional leader. You are working in classrooms with teachers, with student work in front of you, and talking about professional practice. And that is different. That really has changed in the last 10 or 15 years. That expectation that principals don't just stay in the, in the office and write the newsletter and handle the parent complaints. They're engaging in really productive, exciting conversations about student learning and student achievement. And to me, that's, that's a wonderful change. Um, and I know for those of you that never want to leave the classroom because you just love being a teacher, um, I want to assure you that our expectation is that you stay a teacher and that you stay engaged in the good work that happens in our classrooms every single day. On slide 10, when we talk about how the job has changed. That's a wordle. So, um, that's when uh, uh, a survey monkey grabs the, all the responses and puts them, uh, the size corresponds with what people mentioned. And you can see there, instructional leadership, mental health, social media. I think that it really sums up some of the changes over the past five, six, seven years in leadership. Um, the expectation of instructional leadership, uh, dealing with mental health issues, uh, technology and social media, all of those are uh, challenges going forward. In slide 11, uh, we asked the question, if you were hiring a school leader who's going to be in the role for another 10, 15, 20 years, and for many of you that are entering your career, this could be something for the next 15 years that you'll be working in, um, you know, what would you hire for? What would be the biggest, um, what would be the, uh, the most important characteristics? And relationships, growth mindset, emotional intelligence. Uh, again, if, if you're really fixed, if you have a fixed mindset, if you think you've got it all figured out, and that that's going to serve you for the rest of your career, this is the wrong job. I can tell you that right now. Um, uh, being able to, um, to build trusting relationships with parents, with students, and with staff will really be uh, something that will help you thrive, not just survive in this, um, uh, in, in, uh, in this new world. Um, you know, certainly the managerial pieces are really important. Uh, being able to get the forms done when we need the forms done, being able to do your health and safety inspections, making sure that you've, um, uh, you've done your staffing correctly and on time. All those things are really critical, and we do give a lot of support to our leaders uh, in those regards. 
but if if you're a great manager but you can't relate to people it will be a long um, and I, I could say unsatisfying career for you so let's talk about the process in slide 12 so the process is a little bit different we're front end loading a lot of our process here we've asked you to submit three references one being your current supervisor uh, a, uh, a resume um, which is completed online and submitted on apply to education a cover letter your cover letter generally just introduces you and gives us your why. Um, so this would be where you would say, this is who I am. Here's a little bit of my experience. This is why I think uh, I would be really good for this role and why you should consider me. And uh, the next statement, again, that's, that's a little different, is our statement of leadership experience. And I know we've had some questions regarding that. So I'm going to be spend a little bit time uh, uh, talking about that on the next slide. Um, but this this is um, where we get to uh, find out a little bit more about you. So before you actually come and sit down with us in an interview, we want to have more information, um, kind of like scouting data. Um, and uh, for those of you that work within our system, we probably know a little bit more about you. Those of you that are outside our system right now, um, we're really looking to gather more information about about who you are and why you are here now. And um, uh, you know why you believe that you would be really good in this role and on slide uh, 13 we talk about statement of leadership experience 250 to 500 words and we really do mean no more than 500 uh, please don't write the great Canadian novel um, uh, this is not an essay competition so I know that many of you who applied to teachers college had to write a, an essay of application this isn't that um, and believe me, I know, I've sat on those panels that adjudicated those essays, so that's not what we're looking for. What we're looking for is in your professional career, what brought you to this place? Why are you here now, at this stage of your career? What brought you here? What were those, those kind of milestone events and experiences and reflections that brought you to, the, to, the, um, uh, to this point in your career where you would like to be either A, a vice principal, or B, a principal. What were those things? And it, you may wish to talk about, um, and, and I know I've had people commenting saying, well, do you want to know about my, um, you know, I was on the student council and I was a camp counselor. All those things um, uh, are great things, but I'm really looking for those professional experiences. They may be mentors who you have worked with, who tapped you on the shoulder and said, this is a direction you should be heading. Uh, it may be leadership that you have shown within a department or within a panel. Um, it may be uh, times when you took initiative within schools to move things forward. It may be experiences that actually may have been failures at the time but caused you to reflect on how you could do your practice differently. Um, there may be opportunities when you have, um, you know, when you've been in a position where you've really wanted to advocate for a student that was really kind of unpopular in your school and you figured out that through that um, you know you wanted to be in a uh, in a position where you could advocate for kids um, with um, you know with different leverage um, what were those leadership experiences which again made you who you are today and that we should be aware of and we are going to read those leadership experiences as well as your CV and your experience as well as your covering letter we are going to read those very carefully um, and this is going to help us personalize our interview with you. So we may actually say in our interview, we noticed in your statement of leadership that a leadership experience that you did this or you had this experience. Can you go into a little bit more background in that? Can you give us a bit more information or what did you learn from that? Um, all of this is a way of giving us more data on you, who you are, what makes up your authentic person and, and your professional profile. Um, and this is going to be really different. There is no uh, cookie cutter um, uh, statement here. Uh, we're not looking for sort of the key words. We don't have a checklist saying, okay, they mentioned the Ontario Leadership Framework and they mentioned growing success and they mentioned um, you know, the Education Act. All of those things you may wish to weave in, um, but we really are looking for finding out who the authentic you is. Um, and again, getting to that point where I really want to lead a school I want to be in a leadership role and this is why especially considering the context of where the Upper Canada School Board is now um, I want to be a part of that 
Um, just to give you a heads up on interviews, we haven't formalized the dates, but the week of the 6th to the 10th, uh, about a month from now, uh, you may want to circle those dates on your calendar. Um, we'll be firming that up over the next couple of weeks uh, as to the interview dates. Um, we are looking to do two interviews with each of you. Um, they'll be on the same day and they will be different interviews. Uh, we'll be um, concentrating on different aspects of um, the leadership framework, the personal leadership resources, and of course uh, using the context of your, um, uh, of your statement of experience and your, uh, your CV. Um, uh, people always ask, am I going to get the questions beforehand? You will for one of them, you won't for the other. So one, you will get them be about 30 minutes beforehand, the other, you will go in cold. Um, and um, uh, I, I do always say, we may ask, ask you back for another interview. We have done that in the past, because one of the things we understand about uh, when we do admin selection uh, is that... It, any process is going to be a little bit flawed. It's not going to give us everything that we're going to understand about you. So we may need to ask you back and say, can you give us a bit more information about this? Or can you tell us a little bit more about that? That's not for everybody. I just wanted to give you a heads up that that might be happening as well. Um, another thing that people ask me as well is saying, well, are you, this is one process. Are you going to hold another one? Yes, we anticipate holding a second process probably in the winter time so we're looking at like a march uh a february march uh process uh, i know there are people that are saying hmm, i don't know if i'm ready right now to apply i think i'd like to do it a a, a second round um and uh, i can tell you with some assurance there will be a second round um and we would like to do those before we do our next round of leadership placements for the springtime so you'd be looking for that probably mid-February, early March. That would be our, 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 our time frame for that. So the leadership journey, and this is my last slide, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, you know, we consider everything interconnected when we talk about leadership journey. So certainly instructional leadership is really the core and key of who we are as a board and what our expectations are uh, of our leaders. Um, but we also understand your ability to manage a building um, is, is critical to our mission, uh, as well as building the relational awareness as you do that. And, and all those things are interconnected. And, you know, our, uh, our experience is that um, people who um, have a real uh, passion for learning, great instruction, uh, for seeing kids um, as, um, uh, as incomplete in that, they need our help and assistance, and we can intervene and get them to a better place. Uh, and more than anything, we're looking for compassionate people. We're looking for empathetic people. Uh, we're looking for people whose default mode is one of compassion, uh, both for students and for the people we serve, um, who have um, an empathetic response, an understanding that people sometimes are not presenting their best selves when they come to us, and that it's our job to find uh, a pathway to a better future for all our kids. Um, all these things are really key. And, and you know, it, it's, it kind of sounds like we're looking for Superman or Superwoman. And I kind of get that sometimes. <laughs> but we're really not. Our expectation is not that you uh, are the perfect candidate or the perfect teacher or the perfect leader. Our expectation is that um, you're really interested in growing with us. Um, that you actually recognize that you don't have all the answers and that sometimes there will be a lot of uncertainty in this gig uh, and that you may be uh, and you know that that uh, that we deal a lot with with the areas of gray shades of gray you know you're not getting paid in education for black and white you're getting paid for the nuances for using your professional judgment for uh, uh, working collaboratively with others, with admitting sometimes that you don't know the answer, but you're really interested in finding out, um, that you're interested in problem solving, that you're optimistic about finding a solution that will make things better for people. Um, that's who we're interested in. Um, we're really not interested in, in the perfect candidate because that person doesn't exist. We're interested in authentic people who really want to uh, go on a leadership journey with others. Uh, and of course, all of this is for the betterment of kids. So that's my very long-winded uh, presentation. Um, I trust that maybe answered some of your questions at least, um, but I'd be happy now to uh, throw it open to the group. And I see we've got about 30 people online right now, so um, 
uh, if you wish just to pipe in, uh, I'd be happy to respond. Uh, those of you that may not wish uh, uh, just in the, um, uh, just, you know, uh, for whatever reason, you don't want to uh, answer uh, uh, over the phone, you may want to type in your, your, uh, your question and we'll monitor that as well and we'll answer as we go. Yep. Uh, I'm going to turn it over actually right now to Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer is just going to give you a uh, few more technical pieces of information as well. Yeah, so a question that's come up to me, and this is more for our Upper Canada applicants, is if they accept a vice principal position, uh, are they on leave from their teaching position for a year? Um, and I think where some of the, that question comes from is we do sometimes have temporary interim principals or vice principals that are still part of the bargaining unit. If you're permanently appointed, that means you're permanently appointed to that position and you're not able to, after the fact, go back to your teaching position and retain your seniority. So that is something that's um, come up a few times when I present at the PQP course that um, Upper Canada offers. Um, so I just wanted to give some information on that. And Dave spoke a little bit about candidates um, potentially being asked back for additional uh, interviews. I just want to emphasize that, that Dave's done a really good job of trying to, to offer debriefs to people. Um, so if you don't get into the pool that first time, don't let that discourage you because yeah. he'll be offering you a debrief. Um, it'll help you in your growth within your per current position, um, with, it, with potential future positions. So I think that debrief part is a really, um, really valuable piece of this process. So just to really emphasize that if you don't, if you don't make it into the pool the first time, uh, not to give up and really take that feedback uh, that Dave uh, will provide. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, a question I got earlier today, and I'll just put it out there. I got a question today from a candidate saying um, part of their leadership experience is working with the union um, at FOR or OSS. And uh, is that okay? And should I mention that? So, um, great question. And um, I always say yes, that's a, a great leadership experience. Um, uh, and um, you know our expectation is when you're a leader with the board, um, working with uh, our unions is part of the job. Uh, and when we talk about relational awareness and building trusting professional relationships, that includes uh, working with our union partners. Um, and it's it's um, it's not a bad thing. In fact, quite frankly, it's it's a it's a bit of a plus if you have that experience. So please don't hesitate to um, you know to uh, to talk about that leadership experience as well. So this is called wait time when you ask a question in a classroom and you just wait for a few minutes to see if anyone is brave enough to ask the first question. Okay, so I'm gonna hang out here for just a couple of minutes extra online. For those of you that wish to uh, uh, that wish to uh, to bail right now and get on with your evening, that would be great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have another session going at uh, 4:30 on Thursday, so look forward to chatting with you further. Thanks very much, and uh, talk to you soon.